All right, hello again, everybody. We are still here at Amazon Web Services reInvent, which is our annual conference here in Vegas. We uh, have some really, really cool content prepared for you for the rest of the week. But for now, we are going to continue with interviewing our AI Summit speakers today. Uh, I am Randall Hunt, and I'm here with the amazing Nikki Klein. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki. And we have the pleasure now of speaking with Dr. Ron Fedko. So, Let's talk about movies. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your research and, and what you're doing and, and what brought you here to reInvent today? Sure, so um, currently in making movies, we've gotten pretty good at procedural methods in order to generate you know, smoke, water, fire, explosions, destruction, that sort of thing. But we're really bad at, at some effects in movies. For example, we're not very good at faces. There's an uncanny valley where faces look a little odd in movies still. And um, we're not that good with cloth. And so the big change these days is instead of using algorithms like F equals MA or the Navier-Stokes equations, we're working more with data-driven methods to try to get that extra jump. And so the idea is, can you go out and uh, record with cameras what someone's doing with their face and learn from that how to drive the faces in films, especially faces you don't have like Thanos or the Hulk or something like this. So to rephrase that, instead of using you know a, a equation that defines how the motion should happen, what you're working on is machine learning applied to one image mapped to the image that we see in the film. Yeah, the machine, you want to uh, collect data and use the data to bridge the gap. We still use F equals MA, we still build muscle models and all that stuff, but uh, that's not enough because we don't know uh, how that stuff works. And so the idea is to use data to bridge the gap. You can think of all of the procedural stuff now as a strong prior for the machine learning. And then data gets us the rest of the way there. And, and what kind of movies have you guys worked on? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I work with Industrial Light and Magic as a consultant. And so we work on all, all the big films there. And, um, and all the Star Wars movies, oh, all the Harry Potter movies. Um, uh, all the Avengers. I should have brought my other jacket. I actually have a VFX Crew 2008 Iron Man uh, jacket from the very first Mar Marvel Universe uh, film that I worked on. That's really cool. Can you explain how it works, like with the face? Like, so if, if I was playing the Hulk, um, how you actually map to the Hulk's face? Yeah. So if uh, Ruffalo was playing the Hulk, yeah. you'd put the motion capture dots on the face that, yeah. that we always see, and then you would build a 3D model of Ruffalo and of the Hulk, and you'd put uh, dots on that face. It's like a, it's like a three-dimensional puppet in CG. And the idea would be, you know, if you're filming Ruffalo and he smiles in a certain way, you want to figure out how to press a bunch of um, uh, buttons on the, the CG face to make that one smile the same way. Mm -hmm. Once you figure out how to do that on your CG Ruffalo, then you can map that to your CG Hulk, and the Hulk can do the smile. Problem is, that doesn't work as well as it's sort of advertised. When you see the, the stuff on TV, they don't explain all the time that uh, animators put in by hand, tweaking things to make it look good. One of the things you have to do is like draw the contours for the mouth and uh, by hand, every, every they're all drawn. And then the dots they're aren't good at capturing. Dots aren't good. Because you have no dots on the boundary of the mouth. So if I open my mouth, tilt my head back and forth, the line, the, the silhouette line changes. Think of the line here, if I turn it, the silhouette against the camera is changing. Right. There's no dot tracking that. And so when you want to track those subtle features, it's done by hand. What we're trying to do is take the standard machine learning type uh, software for face detection, which draws a bunch of lines and key points on a face. Mm -hmm. and it can do many, many faces. It's trained on all kinds of faces. If we can make that more consistent, then we can use that to feed the algorithm instead of having an animator do it. And so we can use the, the face detectors on our CG model rendered to a plate and on you know, filming Ruffalo or another actor rendered to a plate, and then try to match those by solving an optimization problem. And for those of us who aren't in the film industry, I live in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, and I just got a tour of Universal Studios, but a plate is is like a, a thing that comes from the camera, and then, Right, okay. the plate's what the director would see. Oh, okay, cool. And then, and then in, in post-production, you know, a place like Indust Industrial Light and Magic or Digital Domain, we, uh, we build all these uh, 3D models, and our goal is to composite a bunch of layers on top of that plate, you know, we want to remove uh, Ruffalo and put and put the Hulk in. You know, that sort of thing. That's pretty cool. I, I especially it's like the Star cool. Wars stuff. Uh, do you guys do the the ship animations as well? Yeah, I mean the Star Wars films. Uh, Industrial Light and Magic was uh, founded by by George Lucas back right. in the uh, 70s, I think. It's been yeah. so long I don't even remember. But uh, he sold it to Disney more recently. But you know, for the full uh, uh, Star Wars movies, we do the whole thing. We did all the Star Treks too, by the way. Really? Yeah. Wow. So ILM has a great, has a fantastic history. 
did you you worked with the Next Generation? Uh, a little bit. I, I've been there for uh, 18 years now. Okay. Wow. So the first movies I did there, I did Smoke for the old Jurassic Park, like the old school Jurassic Park, in um, early 2001. So animating Smoke in 2001 with the compute resources that you had at that time was that fairly frustrating. That was and, tough. Okay. We bought a bunch of supercomputers. It was, and then literally within years, with some new algorithms, we're doing it on a laptop. I bet. Same yeah. stuff. It, yeah, Terminator 3. We were doing. Uh, we blew up Los Angeles uh, and did a smoke plume on a laptop. <laughs> it was pretty pretty simple. But that's the thing is that that was Navier Stokes equations. We've gotten really good at that. So, but it's still our faces and cloth are still terrible, and we, we haven't gotten any better at that yet. What would be the other use cases for the facial models that you're building? So another use case would be for de-aging actors. That's our big uh -huh. one. We want to we want to bring back Connery as Bond, right? That's the best yeah. Bond. So why would you want anyone else? And the idea is is that. You know, you want to have the younger Connery to do it. Right. And if you could uh, get it, get an actor, I mean, think about Jim Carrey playing a Connery Bond, right? So you could you could film Jim Carrey, uh, do a bunch of machine learning on the on the plate to figure out what his face is doing, how he's actuating it, and then build a, a 3D model of Bond from the old movies. You could use, again, a lot of machine learning and data to figure out how to drive that so it's characteristic and seems like him. And then uh, Jim Carrey could drive it the same way Ruffalo drives the Hulk model. Same wow. idea. So. And, I've seen research recently on something called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, and people are saying you can use those to generate you know, uh, a fake face or to transform one face to another face or give somebody purple hair in, in real time. Does, does this allow you to do something similar but without a GAN? Yeah, one of the things in GANs, which is, um, is nice actually, is that uh, GANs can use to mend things together. So if you want to do the face, it's hard. Uh, all these like convolutional neural networks need to be downsized, the images. Right. But we need high res for movies. Oh, of course. And so we want to do like little patches in very, very high res and then seam them back together. And again, is like fantastic for that. Right. We do it with cloth panels, like we'll break the cloth up into pieces and then feed the pieces into the, to the networks and learn each piece, but then it leaves like discontinuities and bumps in between the seam and together and the GANs work for that. And the GAN can look at the whole mesh and say, hey, we're going to make this a real cloth. In fact, I just found out Ian Goodfellow took my class at Stanford back before I went into his PhD. He was an undergrad or master's student there, and he took my um, my continuous math class before he made the GANs. Wow, that's wow. yeah. He had written this book, and I was reading the book that he wrote. He's first author on his machine learning book, and um, I emailed him with some uh, corrections for the book, like just typos and stuff. And then he wrote back, that, "Yo, you don't remember me from your class?" That's pretty so, impressive. Yeah, so that's... I'm a big fan of GANs because actually, you know. Him. That's really, really cool. Okay, Super well, awesome. uh, we are going to go on to some other content here at reInvent, but we can't wait to see everybody. If you see us wandering around, feel free to grab us, check out all the awesome talks. Uh, your talk is going to be recorded in one of them, and I can't wait to learn more. Thank you so much for coming on the stream with us. It was really interesting hearing what you do. Thanks. So, check it out on Stephen. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.